and welcome to the first lecture of this course, money and like other money stuff. My name is Jeremy Chiquette, and I will be your instructor for the semester. Now, a little bit about me before we get started. My name is Jeremy Chiquette, and I will be your instructor for this semester. So what if I already said that, sue me. I have a PhD in economics from Clemson University. My area of research was in monetary economics, which I like to think makes me fairly well suited to be instructor in this course. Um... When it comes to how you should refer to me, just call me Jeremy, please. I don't like Dr. Chiquette. I mean, it sounds cool. It sounded really cool like the day I passed my dissertation defense and all that. But after a while, you just start kind of start going like, you know what? Look, just call me Jeremy. Like, we're all adults here. We're all grownups. Um, I, I, don't, I don't need you to call me Dr. Chiquette just to, you know, make me feel better about myself or establish some kind of hierarchy in the course. I don't really care about that. Look, I'm your teacher. You're my student. As long as we all understand that, there's no point in having any of these like formalities. Mr. Chiquette, don't call me that either, please. Professor Chiquette, well, I'm not a professor, so you can't call me Professor Chiquette, even if you wanted to. So, uh, well, enough about that. Let's go ahead and uh, get started, shall we? <clears throat> We're going to begin this lecture and this course with a very fundamental question of what is money? Now, it sounds pretty simple, right? It sounds like a pretty easy question until you really sit down and think about it. Like, what is money? When I took money and banking in, I think it was 2008, when I was an undergrad, I walked into this class. I was like 10 seconds late. Teacher didn't like anybody being late. Wish I would have known that. Well, you know. I wish I would have known that 11 seconds before I walked into that class, but he didn't like late people. And what he would do to people that came in late is he would point to them and ask questions. So he's like, you, what is money? And I'm like, uh, shit. Um, uh, is it dollars? And he's like, no, well, dollars are kind of money, but dollars are currency. And I was like, oh, great. So my face is like turning beet red. I'm starting to get the shakes. Hadn't smoked a cigarette in a while at that point, but God, I really wanted a cigarette then, let me tell you. So it's a currency. But if it's currency, it's being a little snobby because it's like, well, what about other currencies, right? It's kind of like leaving that one kid out of kickball, like, you know, and everybody's getting lined up and they're like, I want this person, this person, and this person to be on my team. And this other guy's like, I want this person to be on my team. You know, there's always like that one kid that gets left out. Well, this would be like leaving out literally every kid that doesn't have a dollar sign on his forehead. So like, okay, what about pesos or euros or other currencies, right? The the Japanese yen, Chinese yuan. What about all those, right? Well, we can't leave those out, but even that still doesn't work. Because it's not exhaustive enough of a list. To be honest, we'd have to cover literally everything that's ever been considered a currency, which can't be done because we'll never really know what all of them are slash were. Right? There are a lot of things that are used as currency that we're completely unaware of. You know, if you go to like some tribe in like sub-Saharan Africa, they're probably using stuff within that tribe as a currency that we have no idea what it is. Hell, half of us probably wouldn't even be able to pronounce it. So we're like, okay, there's these things that are being used. I've got no idea what they are, but there's stuff that is being used as a currency, and we can't leave that stuff out. <clears throat> not to mention, currency is money. Like, all currency is money, but not all money is currency. So currency doesn't work. All right, what about bank reserves? So you go to a bank. Manage to sneak a look in that bank vault when you think about, like, robbing the place. <laughs> Great. Here goes my YouTube privileges. You look in that bank vault, and you see all that cash just chilling there. You're like, God, wouldn't that be nice? What could I buy with that? Or me, I'd be going, God, that's really nice. How much of my student loans could I pay off with that? Well, that's money. But what about deposits? I mean, why would you be in the bank in the first place? Maybe you want to deposit some money, right? You get your cash, you go in there, I want to deposit this cash. Now, for those of you 
that are watching this that are like, you know, not any age older than like 24 or 25, right? Cash is this thing we used to carry around. It's this green money. It was this green paper. And it would have like a one for a $1 bill, 10 for $10, so on and so forth. Nobody really uses those anymore because, well, that just kind of became a thing of the past. Now it's, you just have this plastic, but way back in the day, you would go deposit cash at the bank. When you're depositing that cash at the bank, you could look in that vault and be like, ooh, I want some of that. But we can't leave that out, right? We can't leave deposits out. What about institutional money market funds or short-term repurchase agreements? Now, these guys here are broader forms of money, but they're all technically money. <clears throat> so this is probably going to be a little bit more complicated than we thought it was going to be. But then again, if it wasn't, um, I wouldn't be teaching you this course right now. I'd be like, here's what money is. It's a really simple thing. Okay, end of course. And, well, it's not really fun for anybody. So we can all agree that money is more than just currency. Now, I went to Wikipedia at 1.22 a.m. on November 12th, 2017, and I found that money is any item or verifiable record that is generally accepted as payment for goods and services and repayments of debts in a particular country or socioeconomic context. I know, I know, I know, I know. I got it at 1.22 a.m. Don't ask too many questions because I was just waiting for my NyQuil to kick in. Now, this was also like almost five years ago. I don't have a NyQuil problem anymore. It's called z now, and it's not as bad. I don't see the purple elephants. I don't look funny when I look at myself in the mirror on z -Quil. And, uh, well, I sure as hell don't see these things anymore. Yeah. Yeah, you get one look at that, you're like, you know what? z it is. So what makes money money? Well, it's something we can spend something that we can denominate wealth into, into some kind of mutually agreed upon value. It can buy nightmare fuel like those evil robots are pretending to be Baby Yoda while they're chowing down on little baby dolls. It can do and be a lot of things, and it can buy you a lot of things. Hell, it can even buy you this, Two Tickets to Paradise by Eddie Money. Great song. Okay, maybe, maybe I think so, maybe you don't. But having Two Tickets to Paradise isn't going to cut it. So maybe we can try again in this presentation. Maybe you won't screw me up so badly with bad 80s references. So to be money, something's got to meet a couple of requirements. These requirements are called functions of money. Basically, these are the purposes that money serves. Or a better way to think of it is by asking, what does money have to be to be able to do things to be called money? And it to answer that, it needs to satisfy four functions. If it can do these four things, then it's money. And if it can't, then, it, well, it's not. The first thing it's got to be is it's got to be a medium of exchange. <coughs> and by the way, this kind of really raspy voice is brought to you by the Omicron variant of COVID-19. They call it the Omicron variant. It's a true international shop of pressure or whatever that our brilliant, illustrious president called it. To be a medium of exchange, money... Money needs to represent real goods and services and be agreed upon in value by both parties in the exchange. Here's an example. Money has to be made in intermediary in trade. Suppose you got two cows, your neighbor's got 20 pigs. You want a pig, your neighbor's willing to trade with you. Very nice of your neighbor. Now, if there's no money, you got to give him a cow for a pig. But if you think a cow's worth more than a pig, because it is, well, then you're uh, screwed. You're screwed. So to be a medium of exchange, if you think a cow is worth 10 pigs, you'd have to trade that cow for 10 pigs, but you'd have nine more pigs than what you wanted because maybe you wanted to slaughter and eat that one pig, but now you got nine pigs you got to take care of. You may not have the infrastructure on your farm to take care of those extra nine pigs. So like, what are you going to do? Now, one alternative, you could just take the L on the cow, lose 90% of your wealth just to get a pig that isn't worth all that much. It's only worth 10% of your cow. The other be to wait it out until you slaughter one of your cows and trade some cuts for the pig. But either way, the economy loses value, right? Because it's kind of like that J.G. Wentworth, like, it's my money and I want it now. So the economy is going to lose value. However, if we introduce money into this, money becomes our medium of exchange. What if you had only one cow and 
money that was worth a second cow. Well, now you could buy one of those pigs and not lose any value. So money is more divisible than the goods that it represents. It's one of the things that makes money so great. It makes exchange very, very easy. We could use money for plenty of things like a shady drug deal, for example. Now, the thing about this, this isn't the first time I've given this lecture. And maybe the second time I gave the lecture, I got a good look at this picture. And I realized the kid that's selling the, uh, what is presumably like oregano here. Uh, look at that kid's arms. That kid looks like he's probably about 12. And it makes me wonder, what is a 12-year-old doing dealing weed, especially in front of a school bus? Like, it's been a long time since I was in school. Like, a very long time. Uh, and I've, I've, of course, never sold drugs. Never. Uh, but if I were to sell drugs, why in the hell would I do it in front of a school bus? Like, what? Yeah, that's weird. But whatever. Propaganda photos for the win. So money means that you don't need a double coincidence of wants, which is where you and the other person value your indivisible items equally. You both want what the other one has. So like if I want a cow and somebody's got a really big pig, that's the size of a cow, and then I go, this is the value of a cow, and they agree. We could make that trade, but other than then, we're not making a trade, right? Problem with the double coincidence of wants. It's not the easiest thing to make happen, and it doesn't really happen very often. Now, money is also a unit of account. Stolen from study.com while I was making up this lecture. A unit of account is something that can be used to value goods and services, record debts, and make calculations. Money is considered a unit of account and is divisible, fungible, and countable. With money being countable, it can account for profits, losses, income, expenses, debt, wealth, etc., blah, 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 all that good shit. This means a unit of money is used to represent a unit of real goods and services. So if I think a dollar is going to buy me a soda, a dollar is going to buy me a soda, right? Here's a totally, oh God, no, that is not a legitimate transaction. Um, we can assume that this kind lady is asking this kind gentleman uh, directions on how to, um, well, she's lost and she needs to figure out a way to get home. So she's asking him for directions on how to get home. We'll go with that. Money is also a store of value. What does that mean? Well, it means that money that can get you stuff today can pretty much get you the same amount of stuff tomorrow. It's got to hold its value over time. Because if it doesn't do that, it's worthless. In case you ever wondered about alternative monies like Bitcoin. Right? I'm sure you probably all heard about Bitcoin at this point And cryptocurrencies, Ethereum, Dogecoin. Dogecoin to the moon. Go Elon Musk. Right? Well... These things have a store of value, right? Bitcoin's got a store of value. I don't know exactly what Bitcoin's worth right now. I think it's somewhere in like the 50,000s or something like that. But the problem is it's extremely volatile, like extremely volatile. So it's got a store of value, but it doesn't hold a lot of value from day to day. So it's not as useful as something like the dollar. If we were to compare the volatility of the U.S. dollar to the volatility of Bitcoin, this is what we would get. Right, that really nice kind of flat, sort of skinny uh, curve we see here is the U.S. dollar. What we see in blue is the Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin at times is worth, well, is way more volatile than the dollar. Sometimes it's just about as volatile as the dollar. But over time, we can see it's not particularly stable. And we would want something that's stable if we're going to be holding a currency that we're going to be trading in, right? If $3 gets you a gallon of gas today, you better hope to God $3 gets you a gallon of gas tomorrow. Because otherwise, if it's like 6 or $12 gets you a gallon of gas tomorrow, you're like, well, that sucks. And the next day, it's like $1.20 gets you a gallon of gas. You get really confused. And you're like, I don't even know when to spend my money anymore. That's not good because we want nice, even, steady consumption. We want nice, even, steady times of like, you know, being able to spend our money. So when the Bitcoin becomes much more unstable than the dollar, well, maybe we just want to stick with the dollar for now. Now, money being a store of value means like if you were going to say sell someone a bunch of guns, the money you earn today 
better be worth at least something tomorrow. Now, this is kind of where the negative nominal interest rate problem pops up, which uh, we're going to get to much, much later in the course. Don't worry about that right now. It's like super crazy interesting, but I think there's a lot we need to learn before we learn about that. So I'm not even going to lie here. Uh, this guy is selling an AK-47, and Nicolas Cage looks really, really cool in sunglasses. Like, super cool. Um, this guy was trying to sell me an AK-47. I might actually be tempted to buy one. But money's got to do more than just those two things. It's also got to be a standard of deferred payment. It means money can settle a debt. Like the drug dealer, once that kid he gave weed to to compensate him, well, money can do it. The lady in the red dress's boss wants her to give him his cut. Um, then, well, money can settle that. But of course, you know, there's no cut for him to get because she was simply asking that kind gentleman in the car for directions. So to wrap up, we talked about four functions of money. It's got to be a medium of exchange, has to be a unit of account, has to be store of value, and it has to be a standard of deferred payment. And we talked about what these four things mean and how they can be applied to understanding what money is. For example, if something doesn't meet these criteria, then it just can't be money. But there's a lot of things that you may think are money or that you may not think are money that would meet these criteria. Thus, it would actually make them money. Can you think of any? <clears throat> Consider cigarettes in prison, for example. All right? Cigarettes getting passed around in prison, that is a form of money in prison, right? That's their currency. But, you know, we were like, well, that's not a dollar or a whatever or a Bitcoin. But in prison, it works just fine. It allows them to basically have some kind of medium of exchange that is a unit of account with a store of value that serves as a standard of deferred payment. If you want to pay somebody to do something in prison, you can give them some, some cigarettes or something. I don't know. But there's other things than that. Think of like one or two others on your own because that'd be kind of cool. Now, in the next lecture, we're going to talk about what makes up the money supply. So this is where we're going to get a little bit more exact in terms of how to like compute the money supply, how to derive it, how to know, you know, what is each component of the money supply? Because there are different forms, different measures of the money supply, and each one has, well, different things in it. So here's a spoiler and the Dexter New Blood finale, Harrison and Dexter go, oh, got, oh, okay, maybe it's a little too soon for that. Uh, here's another spoiler. Some of what you think is part of the money supply isn't. And the money supply actually has way more to it than you would ever think it would. But that's for the next lecture. So until then, keep your eyes open. If you haven't seen this movie, uh, I do not suggest you watch it until you are no longer in my class. Once you are no longer a student of mine, ask me what the movie is. I'd be more than happy to tell you what it is. But because I don't want to lose my job, don't worry about what it is until the end of the class. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Despite my horribly raspy COVID voice, um, we uh, will reconvene later this week with another video. And uh, in the meantime, I have posted a very short problem set that kind of goes over what to, uh, well, what to expect to get out of this video that will be important. So answer that and uh, you should be good to go. And uh, I will catch you later.